Good morning everyone, here we are, another day, living the dream. Um, we're back in the office again, which is fine. And today I uh, stumbled over a video from High Fidelity, the musical, and we did a press like launch, maybe like 10 days into rehearsals. It was really like, it was like really soon in rehearsals. I don't actually think we finished the piece by now. Because we did this press launch, uh, people came in and filmed the opening number, because that was like the only really one we knew. Um, and I found it on YouTube from one of the outlets, and I think it's from BritishTheatre.com. So what I thought we'd do today is watch it together, and I'll tell you a bit about it. Should we do it? I'll give you a bit of context, a bit of how I was feeling and behind the scenes. Let's have a look. Here we go. This is weird watching this back. Okay, quickly, um, this set isn't our set. This set was for Torch Song, the play before High Fidelity. We got our set maybe like a week before we started. And this was actually like a really big hindrance because we got used to this sort of like square set, the stairs at the back, and we were trying not to use it. You know, we were trying not to like lean on the back set or use these levels because we knew we'd get another set, like our own set. Normally when you rehearse, you rehearse in an empty space um, and that's so much easier because you just don't get used to those sort of, you know, the telephone or the stairs or that. Um, so yeah, this is really hard to strip that all away when we've got our own set. So as I walk in there, I flick, I flick a switch, which remained in the actual show. I flick like, you know, my shop, I flick the light switch and it all sort of started. But I mean, it didn't really make sense, but it sort of made sense in a way because it's not our set. <laughs> so these are all the people who come to the shop quite often. And we wanted all the people to come into the shop, you know, who sort of dwell in the shop to be sort of outsiders i guess so when you see them walk in it's all very like hunched and, and you know sort of like in their own little world the point being is that the people who come to the shop come to the shop to escape and they might not be loud and big personalities they sort of find their comfort in music i thought it was really cool this is really weird watching this back My Desert Island all time top five breakups. One, Alison Ashworth. Two, Penny Hardwick. Three, Charlie Nicholson. Four, Sarah Kendrew. And five, Jackie Allen. Quick little uh, director's note there. I pause on the last name because as the show goes on, you realize that Jackie Allen isn't real. And he, Rob's only made Jackie Allen up to keep Laura out of his top five and um, so that was always a point that I wanted to make to pause and go uh, Jackie Allen because Jackie Allen isn't real so that's why I always did that and also they were really hard like sort of names to remember <laughs> I never messed them up though which was good and I'm Rob Gordon I'm currently maxing out a mixtape for a girl called Laura Um, this quickly was meant to be like foreshadowing. So this was meant to be our breakup and like a little quick sort of glimpse of what's gonna happen. Um, Cause in the next scene after the opening, this is what happens and we wanted to try, just played it then, sorry. We wanted to try, you know, sort of warn the audience like this is gonna happen and for it not to be surprised. So mainly that they just concentrate on like the reasoning why rather than being like, oh my God, they broke up. You don't need 
to know that. Can you hear the tube yes, above yeah. the rail well, arch? you do need to know that the making of a great mixtape, like Breaking Up, is hard to do. You've got to kick it off with a killer song to grab attention. Then you've got to take it up a notch. But you don't want to blow your load, so you've got to cool it off a notch with something so forth. Also, you can't have two tracks by the same artist side by side, unless you've done the whole thing in pairs. Anyway, there are a lot of rules. So quickly, um, this first monologue was to the audience, and it was so weird because this was like the first time I had an audience. I mean, it was mainly press, and well, it was, it was only press. Um, but it, it, it sort of took me by surprise a bit. And then when we finally opened, and we had our set, and we had our costumes, and you know, first night, I sort of done everything through rehearsals, I sort of done to empty seats. So that first monologue always took me by surprise because I was like, oh my God, there, there are people there. <laughs> I'm not just doing it to empty seats now, they are people. These are my records. No set. <laughs> Currently organised, not alphabetically, not chronologically, but wait for it. Autobiographical. Another tube yeah. going over the uh, to buy the theatre. Which they were purchased. So um, way over here is school. Uh, this bit is college. Um, this section here is university. Well. Tech College. And this wall here is Laura. My life in Barney. I've got everything I need here. So all the ensemble got out there like their own like vinyls and this vinyl was left by Laura and this is basically the track of the opening that I put on to sing, the opening number. Um, so I put it on the chair I believe, that should have been a player, like a vinyl player or something like that. Oh and quickly, that water, that cup, um, that became my water break on stage so that was always full of water so I could like drink it. Music. Quickly, um, these opening lyrics changed all the time. So these are not the original lyrics. We tried to make it more British. So I've got my daily crossword and I've got my cup of tea. I can't remember what the originals are, but they changed so often that it got to the point sometimes I didn't know what I was going to sing. <laughs> I just hope that it was right. It changed all the time. I always did a good mix of like sort of the American version and the British version. <laughs> I've got a pop and angry girlfriend and a pop decent TV. I've got records I collected one by one and bit by bit. And I play them on a hi-fi that makes your hi-fi look shit. A quick accent thing as well in this. You know, the way I say records there sounded a tiny bit American is because I came into this project thinking it would be American. We would do American accents. And it turned out that they wanted to sort of set it in London. And naturally I'm from like northwest of England. So I have a sort of Manchester northern accent. And because it was set in London and Rob Gordon owned a shop in London, which we thought was like near Camden, I just didn't think someone from the north you know, in the sort of 90s, would sort of be down there owning a record shop. And also, I read the book, and originally he was from, like, near Watford. So I sort of went for, like, a soft southern accent. And I didn't want it to be my own accent, basically. So this was sort of near the beginning, because, again, I think we had still, like, a couple of weeks' rehearsals left. And so I found a, a sort of more organic, nicer accent. But you sort of hear it here. But if you hear any, like... If you hear any like Americanisms, it's probably because I'm tr still trying to get them out of my system. <laughs> because I thought we were going to be American. And if my life's not perfect, if 
find anxious, bored or sad Well, today may be less shitty With whole chunks of not so bad And I wouldn't change a thing about it No, I wouldn't even change a thing In a world that's unreliable This is stuff on which to change to meet the real go-getter in an Oxfam sweater. So we changed it a bit. <laughs> so that changed from when we actually did it live. So this is me opening the shop door, which doesn't exist. <laughs> well, this is my shop, Championship Vinyl. We are on a quiet street in Holloway. Carefully placed to attract the bare minimum of passing punters. There's really no reason to come here at all. I get by relying on the folks who can't survive. They bounce up without the Japanese in or the Zap of Force and Fly. They bounce up. They're really kind of sad, hell, I'd be making fun of them. If it was not for the fact I really one of them. And if you're into vinyl, we want to This choreography is so clever um, because Tom, who directed and like choreographed the piece, it was all about like making big arm movements, going, I wouldn't change a thing, and then coming in because they're really like aloof and small and, and uh, introvert people. And that A to K rap was going through the you know the vinyl selection, and it's all sort of like introvert and, and, and small and it sort of had to be because the space was so small. Looking at it now because we're not on our set it looks much more sort of cramped because when we did have our set it was a bit bigger than this. Um, but yeah, very clever choreography. Um, yeah, really fun. <laughs> A bit of uh, an Americanism hanging over there in my voice, but yeah, it was so early on and I was still trying to get, because I, I went away, you know, when I got the part, I, I sort of went through the whole script in an American accent, listened to the soundtrack, which is in an American accent, um, so yeah, I think it was fine on the opening night, but early on in rehearsals like this, it was still hanging over a bit. Quickly before Barry enters, uh, yes, that was a again another like a side to the audience, and luckily that always sort of landed um, because some of the gags and some of the stuff I looked to the audience and said to them like, "Hey, whatever gag," uh, sometimes it didn't land, but that was always a solid one. Um, and it's quite early on that if I did that and they sort of laughed, I was like, "Okay, they're on my side." Top five worst duets of all time. Barry, you're late. Number one. Kiki D and Elton John, don't go breaking my heart. Number two, Kenny and Dolly, Islands in Mystery. Three, Unforgettable, Nat Cole and her dead old man. Number four, Endless, Endless, Love, Diana Ross and Lionel Richie. And number five, George Michael and Take Your Pick. That guy's a duet slot, he will literally sing with anybody. Quickly. So did you hear that? Dun, 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 dun. Um, that was like, again, I think my next note. And once I messed it up, because I come in with no, like, 
um, instrumental, no sort of backing. It's like, what can I do? They were part time. Um, so at this point of the sort of piece, I would always be like, bum, 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 in my head, drawing these lines. Really funny. It's two o'clock. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I stopped to get you a packet of that. Uh, packet of. We changed this. It was something else, I can't remember, but we changed it to custard creams, which is like a, a biscuit. We changed custard creams because it was something else. I can't remember what it was originally, but we changed it to custard creams because it's like a British biscuit. So people would sort of get it more. Custard creams? <laughs> Ready? What can I do? They were part time, but then they started showing up here every day. The joke that no one ever really got, we all look up and go, be careful my nerve gap. It's because of all the tubes going above our head. It's sort of like an in joke that we had. Um, I don't know if anyone actually got it, but we liked it. Again, we changed it to Camden Market because it was something else originally, but Camden is a place in London which we just tried to make it more home. Tesco's another sort of shop in Britain. A bit like Walmart, or a bit like All your local right. sort of man. <laughs> Something about the little guys. Yeah. No shit. Can't pay my rent. I live at home. Staying up till four, watching reruns of Red Dwarf. My go out. My girl inflates. I think I had sex once, but I'm not sure. <laughs> the awkward dancing from all of the people and that is so amazing from Tom the director choreographer who sort of made that happen he didn't want it to be cool he didn't want it to be like musical theatre he wanted it to be these sort of misfits that find their solace and find their home in this record shop so they're like just dancing but it's not stylized and it's very awkward and sort of geeky and it's amazing Inside this door, where would I go? What would I do without it? This is all I'm living for. So, just for people who don't know the layout, the ensemble have gone up like the aisle in the theatre. So they're all in a big line now. That's where they've ran off. They've not run off. Like they're not gone home. <laughs> Um, 
So the guy on the edge there is a guy called Josh and he played T-M-P-M-I-T-W which stands for the most pathetic man in the world and he did an awesome job of that character. So yeah, he's like the biggest outsider of the whole shop. He did an awesome job. Great day, guys, great day. We made nothing. <laughs> I've always dreamed someday I'd have this wonderful career. I went where the music took me. I don't know. <laughs> ensemble doing like weird dancing again um because that's their characters and they were so good at the end i'm sort of on the counter so we didn't have a counter at the time um but in the actual show we had like a till with a counter and, and loads of little things on it um, so i was on that at that point just shouting um but yeah um so that's me reacting to high fidelity um a show that i hold very close to my heart the most challenging role I've ever done, and I'd love to go back one day and do it again. It was so good. Um, well, that's that. Um, so, uh, thanks for popping by, everyone. Be safe out there. Don't forget to live your dream. Oh, yeah.